Uh, we'll welcome up uh, Dr. Chris Conradi. Um, I don't know exactly know how to pronounce his last name after one year. I've heard it lots of different ways, so I'll let him actually say himself. Um, he's one of our first year residents on MD-PhD. If you look up his social media profile, it says that he has an interest in virus something or others. I, I don't know. Um, he's married, fortunately, so he doesn't have to worry about uh, that, but uh, Dr. Patel. So. All right, Conradi, <laughs> your turn. Okay, so I'm Christopher Conradi. I'm one of the PGY2s. I didn't really know what to expect with Dr. Patel up here. You never really know for sure. Um, but I'm going to be talking about a project I've been working on with Dr. Bernstein. And I, I guess without... Uh, Taking it a step further, this has been a kind of a project that many people in this room have had some sort of impact on, and we'll talk about that at the very end. Um, but I basically entitled it The Interrelationships Between Macular Skin and Serum Carotenoids. Um, and so before we get too far into the talk, I have no personal disclosures to declare, but I think it would be relevant to at least discuss that Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Gellerman um, and the University of Utah own a patent on resonance Raman spectroscopy, and we'll be talking about that here in a second. Um, so a little bit of background on carotenoids. Am I too loud back from the back, too quiet? Are we okay? Okay. Um, so carotenoids are fat-soluble pigments found in dark green vegetables and orange fruits and vegetables, uh, with the highest concentration being in kale. Uh, and then a second member of kind of that leafy green family um, in spinach, but you can also see uh, carotenoids in kind of these, in oranges and other fruits. Um, in humans, uh, they've been shown to have, a, or at least presumed to have a function, an antioxidant function. Um, three of the carotenoids uh, that we consume in our diets are concentrated within the macula, lutein zeaxanthine and mesozeaxanthine by specific uh, kind of mechanisms, and we won't really talk about that today, but they're specifically concentrated within the macula to give it the yellow pigment uh, on fundus exam, uh, or the yellow coloration, I guess. Uh, and these carotenoids, at least within the retina, are felt to filter basically more deleterious blue wavelengths of light to reduce reactive oxygen species uh, damage within the retina. Um, and so that's kind of their role. From a clinical perspective, probably the most uh, at least um, interesting aspect from the ocular standpoint is there's been multiple studies uh, that have kind of associated carotenoid concentrations with macular degeneration. Um, and what were those studies? Well, so there's been multiple, and I'm not going to mention them all, but probably the first uh, is that patients with lower serum carotenoid concentrations are at an increased risk of developing AMD. There's been several studies that have shown that. Then kind of the opposite of that, that patients with diets high in zeaxanthine uh, and lutein have a reduced risk of developing AMD. Uh, and then, of course, we're all familiar with the, the AREDS and AREDS-2 studies um, that, at least with the AREDS-2, suggested that carotenoids, or at least supplementation with carotenoids and a couple of other uh, vitamins, reduce progression to advanced AMD. Uh, so that's a very basic kind of background on carotenoids and kind of the clinical uh, importance. Um, so there's been quite a bit of research uh, trying to develop mechanisms to uh, basically measure macular carotenoids. Obviously, we can't go in um, and take uh, samples of the retina. I guess we could, but uh, it wouldn't be great for the patient. Um, and so we've been looking at kind of surrogate markers. Uh, and probably the most or the oldest uh, kind of uh, method has been flicker photometry, and that's here. Uh, and it's a fairly complicated uh, test to perform and takes quite a bit of uh, patient kind of compliance and learning to actually get meaningful data out of it. Um, that's been the most widely used and that basically gives you optical density readings and we'll talk more about that uh, throughout the talk. 
Um, and that's currently um, at least partially being replaced by dual wavelength autofluorescent imaging modalities. Uh, where you basically get a green and blue image from um, autofluorescence and subtract the two to give you a carotenoid concentration. Uh, then there have been other surrogates uh, that have been proposed and studied um, and tissue validated, in fact, so serum um, to, and using HPLC uh, to test concentrations and then resonance Raman spectroscopy, which is basically taking a scan of the skin um, that was developed um, by Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Gellerman to give you kind of a carotenoid concentration within the skin, and we'll talk more about that here in a second. At least from uh, our overall um, understanding of carotenoids, there's really no clear gold standard um, of um, a surrogate for basically macular carotenoid concentrations. Um, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind as I talk. So the two kind of methods we'll be talking about um, in, or in the rest of this talk, I guess, here uh, is resonance Raman spectroscopy. Uh, basically, you put your hand on a little scanner, and it gives you uh, a reading here. And then uh, the spectralis, which is how we get our dual wavelength autofluorescent images uh, that's hooked up to an OCT machine. Um, and our photographers here are incredibly gifted at using this thing. Um, so at least in regards to measuring uh, carotenoid concentrations or surrogates within the macula, uh, like I already suggested, um, basically most of the literature has used flicker photometry or dual wavelength autofluorescence that gives you an optical density reading at 0 0.5 degrees, and we'll talk more about that, so don't worry too much about kind of this uh, optical density versus volume measurement stuff. Um, then Dr. Bernstein actually published a study uh, several years ago um, and was kind of a, a question that we also raised throughout the study, but that showed that skin and macular pigment measurements did not seem to correlate in adults, uh, and then they also kind of showed in children that they did correlate. So there's some disconnect there that we didn't quite understand at that point in time. Um, and then a more recent study, and there have been several of these studies, but basically oral supplementation uh, with lutein or zeaxanthine has an effect on macular pigment optical density readings. Uh, by increasing retinal sensitivity uh, in patients with early AMD, and then like I said, uh, increasing optical density readings. So there seems to be some direct effect that we can measure. Uh, and I've already kind of used a couple of these abbreviations, um, and I'm actually going to make them a little more simple just so we're not having to look at a bunch of letters. So optical density readings are basically like I have kind of hounded on already. Um, then we'll also be talking about volume under the curve measurements uh, that we'll also be talking about, and I'm actually just going to call that volume measurements just for simplicity. Uh, and then resonance Raman spectroscopy, and then, so that's basically the skin measurement, and I'm basically going to refer to that as skin as well, just to simplify things. So we basically walked into this study with a fairly straightforward kind of question, and basically a mathematical question, and that was do more data points, so something like a volume measurement, more strongly correlate with other biomarkers such as serum and skin measurements? than these optical density readings that have been used for 15, 20 years throughout the literature. Um, and then there's been some, like I said, disconnect in the literature with some of the optical density uh, kind of studies. Um, and so we basically propose uh, walking into the study to systematically compare dual wavelength autofluorescent imaging to resonance Raman spectroscopy, and then using basically serum carotenoid concentrations as kind of our presumed gold standard, or at least something of comparison in a clinical setting. Uh, so we recruited 72 patients from retina and general ophthalmology practices here within the Moran. Um, we uh, basically tried to exclude no one, um, but there were a few kind of exclusion criteria. If they didn't have all three modalities tested, uh, we excluded them. Um, if they had a previous diagnosis, of MACTEL or Stargardt's with or with, due to the significant macular pathology, we excluded them as well. Um, and then there was one, and I literally mean one patient that had poor uh, kind of imaging quality, uh, and so we excluded him as well. 
Um, and that was in stage uh, the teleform um, that was kind of skewing that image there. Uh, and then, like I said, we tested all of these modalities and then we compared them. Um, so the patients within this study, uh, average age of 59 ranged anywhere from 30 to 90 years old. Uh, about half of them had a normal uh, kind of retinal exam. About a third of them, or a little less than a third, had some form of macular degeneration. Uh, about a third of them were on some sort of PO supplementation, obviously from uh, kind of the retina practices with presumably uh, macular degeneration and other forms of um, kind of macular pathology. Uh, and so to give you a, an idea of what these optical density measurements look like, so this is a scan with a spectralis, uh, and to take optical density measurements, that's this red bar here, uh, that's 0 0.5 degrees from the central fovea, uh, then you see that spot here. We then, like I said, wanted to test that optical density measurement versus volume measurements. So we looked at a volume measurement within 0 0.5 degrees. We looked at a volume measurement within 2 degrees, so the blue circle or here. And then we went all the way out to 9 degrees from the central uh, kind of macula there uh, that you see here um, and took a volume measurement there as well. And we didn't go any farther out than 9 degrees because the data, and you don't see it well here, um, but gets fairly, uh, not necessarily erratic, but um, less reproducible, likely due to the fact that there's some vasculature um, that's kind of altering or at least obscuring the, the clarity of the images. Um, and so we first uh, asked, do, is there some sort of support for using volume over optical density measurements? And so we took a patient, uh, maybe I shouldn't disclose this, but this is Dr. Bernstein. Um, who basically has a normal diet, has no pathology of any type, compared him to a lady that actually has maybe the first reported case of lutein uh, crystallopathy within the macula because she was taking 20 milligrams of lutein and also consuming a diet very, very high in lutein and zeaxanthine, so literally had lutein crystals within the macula. <coughs> we then look at optical density measurements. They look the same which doesn't really make sense when you have a patient that's consuming high amounts. We've already shown with previous literature that you can affect optical density measurements with a diet or supplementation of some type. We then looked at volume measurements at 0 0.5 degrees. They look the same. However, by the time you get out to 2 degrees, you see nearly a two-fold difference between the patient that had this diet high in lutein and zeaxanthine and nearly a five-fold difference by the time you get out to nine degrees. So this gave us some support of basically using volume measurements and larger volume measurements rather than optical density measurements. So then we went back to kind of our uh, group of patients that we had recruited. Uh, we did a linear regression analysis basically comparing serum zeaxanthine and lutein. So I've already told you that They've been tissue validated uh, with basically serum concentrations and compared that basically to our optical density or volume measurements um, working our way out. All the p-values are significant, less than 0 0.01 with all of these graphs. But what you'll notice is the R-squared value, the farther you get away, well, so optical density, volume measurements at 0 0.5 degrees, R-squared is about the same. However, by the time you get out to two degrees with the volume measurements, you see an increasing R-squared value, and then by the time you get out to nine degrees, even a better R-squared value, which gave us even further support that volume measurements are better than just single optical density measurements. We then looked at uh, skin measurements in a residence res Raman spectroscopy uh, and wanted to show um, just something that's kind of a so what, like this is expected, but basically with zeaxanthine and lutein, uh, you have a nice correlation with these skin measurements, so a possible second surrogate marker um, using skin. Um, and then if we look at all serum pigment, uh, since there's more than just zeaxanthine and lutein in the skin, you get even a tighter correlation uh, with your skin measurement. We then went back to ask the question, could you use skin measurements 
to basically predict optical or basically macular concentrations. And so we compared the two with linear regression, same thing, p-values are all significant. Same kind of similar theme where the farther you get away from the central fovea and more specifically volume measurements are, be are much better than single optical density measurements. Uh, giving further credence to the idea that volume measurements and larger volume measurements, so at two degrees and then even better at nine degrees, are much better than optical density measurements or even volume measurements at 0 0.5 degrees. So then, um, I'm not going to show much more than this just for the sake of time, but basically we have kind of two conclusions here and we have more data uh, to draw other conclusions on. I'm sure some of the questions will come up. But we're basically concluding from this that volume measurements at 9 degrees have a stronger correlation with tissue validated resonance Raman spectroscopy or skin measurements and also serum carotenoid concentrations. What that means is a lot of the literature that's been using optical density measurements is unclear, um, but I'm sure people are probably not going to be too happy um, if they've been using these um, measurements. We'll see. Time will tell. Um, and then we would even go a step further and say that volume measurements at 9 degrees should be utilized in studies going forth. Um, and then the kind of second correlation or second conclusion is that skin uh, seems to correlate well with serum and macular pigment measurements in adults. Uh, and like I told you at the very beginning, there was some kind of disconnect between skin and macular pigment measurements. That's likely due to the fact that the spectralis we now, now have is much more reproducible. Uh, and so we can get more accurate, more reproducible measurements. And that's why we're seeing a correlation that once wasn't seen. Um, and so there are probably a thousand things that we could do with this um, going forth, uh, but probably the two at least that I'll mention, um, the first being evaluating the impact of oral supplementation. And so you could theoretically, I guess, get rate of change um, in a patient with uh, macular pigment concentrations as you follow them over the time after you start them on some sort of lutein or zeaxanthine. It should be kind of interesting to know. Um, and I won't show you the data here, but there seems to be a fairly, there seems to be a population of individuals that seem to respond fairly well to oral supplementation and get supratherapeutic levels, or what we assume are supratherapeutic, versus those that only partially respond to lutein and zeaxanthine. What that means, I have no idea. Uh, then the second and probably uh, more difficult question, but probably more exciting question is, could you use this data um, and these imaging modalities to identify patients at risk of developing AMD um, by lower concentrations of macular pigments um, and potentially alter the course of the disease? <coughs> Um, that's a fairly big question with a lot of variables inside of it and would take a very, very large study, um, but probably uh, a valid and important question. Um, and so here are my citations, um, and then I have a lot of people to acknowledge. These are the people that have been most kind of instrumental in it, but there are several people in this audience that have also kind of given to the cause and had their eyes dilated and imaged. Um, and then also those clinicians that have also helped us recruit patients within their clinics. So with that said, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that people have. Uh, so Dr. Bernstein will be able to speak a little bit more on that. But so if we were to go back, let me just give you a good kind of representation. So if you were to look at these specific numbers, uh, so five-fold difference here, if we look at skin measurements, we've had two individuals with skin measurements over, let me see if I have some data uh, here. So there have been two individuals, and we've actually recruited more patients. Here's the one lady that I was suggesting with the lutein uh, kind of toxicity. We've had literally two patients with values over 100,000. She's one of those. 
Um, and so with these two modalities, so both macular pigment measurements as well as skin measurements, we seem to pick that up. What has been done in clinics, so Dr. Bernstein had her stop uh, her supplementation um, of lutein. Like I said, she was taking 20 milligrams of lutein every day and had been for eight years. Uh, and then has had repeat measurements over time. Um, and I think it was 10 to 15 percent change or decrease per month uh, since going off of the lutein supplementation. So just to answer, I think, with your real question, that was a patient was picked up by a student Turk doctor who just walked out. And she has golden crystals in, right in her cobia, but that were not there. She had been following this patient for a long time. She had a glaucoma, not, not A and B. And she doesn't have any symptoms, but she had these golden crystals. By diet, she was consuming, in addition to her 20 milligrams of lutein per day, she had a spinach, broccoli, kale, avocado, smoothie for breakfast every day for eight years. An enormous load. And we specifically took her off of the, I took her off of the supplements and said, don't bother changing the diet. And the crystals have disappeared already in one of the eyes. So that's why we're writing it out. Yeah. So. Paul, is it similar to like the canthazanthine that, that you know people were showing? For they the do look months? like them, except they're in the fovea. Canthazanthine doesn't go in the fovea. It goes in a circle. And it's very reminiscent of a condition known as West African crystalline maculopathy, which I saw in Ghana. And it does exist, and it's something dietarily that people eat in, Ga in Africa. They thought it was cola nuts, but it's probably a carotenoid that they're consuming there. And by OCT, they're in the, they're in the Henley fiber layer. So another comment I would just like to say, or mention on this, with the spectralis, it's a, I've worked with many different ways of measuring macular pigment, including the psychophysics and, and all sorts of different methods. The spectralis works very well. But it has to be done on a, for the, for the uh, private practice people here, it has to be done on a high-end spectralis with two wavelengths. And the software is not released by, spectral, by Heidelberg yet. So it can only be done under an IRB. So there's only a few sites in the country that do that. Right? And a dilated people. And you need to be dilated, as you would, would expect. But I'm very impressed with it. And, uh, but it's, it's a, this is an interesting project to just kind of see it coming together. Okay, thanks guys.